Thanks. Um, I'm very honored to be here today and thanks for these invitations. Um, I will reflect on uh, the work which is the outcome of um, something done at intergovernmental level with 47 and then 46 member states after uh, Russia had to leave the organization. And as uh, the point was made about the context uh, being so important, I want to emphasize that the starting points among those different member states were very diverse. And I would like to point out maybe two main issues which are really important in this context, particularly, is if I dare to say the state of health of the healthcare systems in those member states, and also the issue of trust with the authorities. And I think here, contrary to um, the elements provided, I mean the uh, comments made by Ross, when it comes to um, distrust, we tend to build up rather than forgetting about experience. And throughout different crises, uh, I think we could say that, that this trust has been growing, at least in many member states of the Council of Europe. And that has already uh, an, import, or, or an important impact on the reality of the pandemic that we've, we've, we've been seeing over those two years. Now, I will start with a sentence that is not very positive. And if I may, I, I will, despite of those diversity of situations, you would see that at the end of the day, we reach agreement, which are not very different than the one actually uh, referred to during this first part of this morning sessions. But if I may, I think that now the key issue will be to go from theory to practice, and that's going to be a, a, a big effort needed for all of us. So this, these first slides show a sentence which was actually one of the first sentences of a very recent document published actually a couple of days ago on the evaluation uh, report of the Council of Europe support to its member states in addressing the challenges related to COVID-19. And you see that it acknowledged that we, and I don't know whether Swedish consider it as part of the we, but uh, in general at the Council of Europe, at national as well as international level, we were not prepared nor fully equipped to uh, address this global crisis of this nature. So the starting point uh, for the Council of Europe is based on, on those kind of, of elements as to, to to um, acknowledge that um, the pandemic revealed and exacerbated uh, existing weaknesses, discrepancies, and challenges in the protection of human rights, in particular in the field of health. Furthermore, during the pandemic, governments and authorities had to make fast, difficult, and often controversial policy choices, which have had an impact on some of the individual rights and freedom that are integral part of our democratic society governed by the rule of law. In addition, and maybe in that sense, Sweden, Sweden is an exception, uh, the level of trust in policies and programs issued by authority have really fallen, and we saw a polarization within communities, at least in many member states, especially concerning the attitude to mass vaccination. And finally, and this was already highlighted, uh, we are not over yet, and we see a number of patients and actually more and more papers published in scientific journal on what we call the long COVID. And this would mean that the health authorities will need to allocate adequate resources to address this situation and optimize health outcomes, having in mind human rights perspective. So, when it comes to the Council of Europe, very early on, uh, it took actions to support its 46 member states in finding ways not only to address effectively uh, the crisis, but to do so uh, ensuring that the measure that they took did not undermine their genuine long-term interest in safeguarding Europe's founding values of democracy, rule of law, and human rights. And the Secretary General of the Council of Europe issued uh, early in 2020 a toolkit for government across Europe on respecting human rights, democracy, and the rule of law during the COVID-19 pandemic. In her paper, and particularly concerning the field of biomedicine, the Secretary General highlighted a certain number of issues which are really important to understand um, the actions taken by the Council of Europe specifically in that field. First, the specific needs of persons belonging to disadvantaged groups 
and the need to prevent discriminations toward them. Decision and policy making should also reflect the need to protect the most vulnerable individuals and groups based on the principle of solidarity, that is inclusive of everyone, as actually the European Group on Ethics highlighted in its uh, opinion. Communication and management of false rumor and misinformation were a challenge during the pandemic in many countries. This revealed an erosion of trust in information and decisions from health authority and the government. Mistrust towards authority is not new, but the COVID-19 pandemic took it towards other circles, including, at least in some countries, scientists and clinicians. It highlighted the importance of trust in managing crises and the role of transparency, accountability, and more generally, public dialogue to help rebuilding that trust. COVID-19, finally, uh, greatly affected healthcare systems and revealed their fragility. This raised major ethical challenges for healthcare professionals and competent authority as well, faced with difficult decisions to take at collective and individual level in a context of uncertainties and scarce resources. Ethical analysis and human rights proved to be instrumental to address those challenges and to take decisions concerning individuals as well as societies. When it comes to the particular action of the Council of Europe in the field of biomedicine and the field of human right protection and biomedicine, which is the responsibility of the Steering Committee for Human Rights in the field of biomedicine and health, um, this, this committee actually had to refocus its priority. In 2019, he had adopted a strategic action plan on human rights and technologies in biomedicine, and uh, this action plan, which was articulated around three main pillars, governance of technology, equity in healthcare, and physical and mental integrity, uh, have identified specific objectives and a list of actions to be undertaken to uh, reach that objectives. And when the pandemic started, the committee had to reconsider this priority. But actually, he uh, agreed that the challenges he had identified were actually reinforced by the COVID-19 pandemic, especially with regard to two main human rights issues, namely equity in access to healthcare and empowerment, which are actually closely related. In the strategic action plan, there, are, there were two specific objectives under the equity pillar. First, to guarantee equitable access to healthcare to every person. That means no discrimination in the provision of healthcare and equitable access to those healthcare, including in situation of crisis. And the second specific objective was to combat health disparities, existing ones created by social and demographic changes in Council of Europe member states. That include migration in particular. Existing healthcare resources are less accessible to certain groups because, for example, of their particular social circumstances. Combating such disparities is therefore important, for instance, by making healthcare services and resources more ac accessible and training healthcare professionals to ascertain the level of health literacy of this person and their capacity to participate in decision making. This is actually based on the Article 3 of the Convention on Human Rights and Biomedicines, uh, which concern equitable access to healthcare. So the committee, uh, very early on, start uh, reconsidering its priority and I would say refocusing them uh, to address more specifically specific issues raised by the pandemic. And it started very quickly by adopting a series of statements, the first of which concerned consideration, human rights considerations concerning relevance to COVID-19 pandemic. And this was adopted in April 2020. Um, just in, in, in between brackets, so to say, um, it, it's, it's obvious that the reactivity at national level and the reactivity at international level is, is slightly different in terms of getting agreement among so many member states is, is always a bit. Uh, t more time consuming, so to say, but still the reactions were quite quick and also the agreement were really easy to, to reach. And I think this is very important in this context. So these um, statements uh, lay down principles to guide decisions and practices in clinical and research field in the context of emergency and health crisis management. It 
again emphasize the importance of equitable access to healthcare as requiring a particular vigilance during the pandemic. And it also underlines the indissociable link between human rights, responsibility, and solidarity. A bit later, the uh, committee agreed on a statement on equitable access to vaccination. And um, this was at a time, it was actually in January 2021, when we started working on this, we, had, we started having um, uh, some vaccine, but the number of vaccines available were not sufficient to vaccinate all populations. So faced with scarcity of vaccines, it was obvious that prioritizations was essential to uphold the right to life and to health protections. The committee was concerned not to increase existing disparities and to put particular attention on persons who are systematically disadvantaged in accessing healthcare, as well as persons in vulnerable situations, including migrants and refugees. And it worked a lot in this context with the special representative of the Council of Europe on migration and refugees. In this statement, it emphasized transparency information, communication, and promotion of public dialogue to help understand citizens' concerns. And this statement actually paved the way for the development of a legal instrument and a guide to health literacy, which I will just refer to in a few minutes. So this work was also accompanied by another uh, statement on vaccination pass at a time that this was very topical. And a series of web, uh, webinar online with, um, on different topics related to COVID and uh, some of you have actually participated in some of those uh, webinars on COVID-19 and testing, on health literacy in COVID-19 context, COVID-19 and public debate uh, dialogue more recently. So when it comes to this legal instrument and the guide, which were actually adopted on the 4th of November this year, so just a few days ago, uh, the legal instrument, the recommendation is still has been approved at the level of the committee, is now in front of the Committee of Ministers for adoption, which will probably take place at the beginning of 2023. But uh, he'd really made consensus. And um, as I told you, the, the committee has reconsidered the focus of its actions. And for that particular recommendation, he decided to focus on equity of access to medicinal product and medical equipment, which are necessary in very um, severe or, or life-threatening situation, when those uh, product and equipment are in a shortage situation. So, the, um, the uh, recommendations uh, recognize the need to strengthen the value of solidarity between individuals. It sets a, a number of principles to guide national priority settings based on medical criteria regarding access to medicinal product and medical equipment to guarantee this equity of access and ask also for especially having in mind uh, disadvantaged population and vulnerable people to remove, to have appropriate support and remove barriers to act to improve the access to um, those services. The recommendation also includes a certain number of procedural principles which are quite familiar with you, like accountability, reasonableness and relevance, inclusiveness and consistency in the implementation of the policies. These recommendations was accompanied by um, another uh, piece of work done by the committee, which is not a legal instrument, but which is a guide to health literacy, considering that actually um, limited health literacy is closely related to adverse health outcome and is a critical social determinant of health. Therefore, improving health literacy in people can improve safety and quality of health care and can save time, cost and life. This guide is intended to decision makers, health professionals, and health providers. It's, it's supposed to be informative and actionable resources. It, it includes a series of good practice examples, and the objective is to keep updating this by adding new examples of good practices over time online. And it's articulated around five actionable objectives. Access to valid health information, access to appropriate care, communications between individuals, health professionals, and health authorities, share decision-making regarding treatment and care, and access to digital space to understand and use health services. Now, in conclusion, um, this COVID-19 pandemic, and I again repeat that I'm, I'm looking at this from a perspective of an intergovernmental organization, 
which has the main missions of uh, promoting democracy, rule of law, and human rights. So the, um, the challenges faced by the states during this COVID-19 pandemic illustrate the importance of democracy, the rule of law, and human rights at time in times of crisis. They reinforce the need for international cooperation and to promote solidarity as well as the role of intergovernmental organization to this end. Um, I must say that the Council of Europe has been focusing uh, on actions taken within member states, not so much between member states when it comes in particular to equity, because we think that it's complementary to the work done, for example, by WHO or other organizations. However, it promotes a lot of cooperation between member states, and I will explain also why. So, you remember my first sentence, could we be better prepared? Probably, and I will repeat what has been said by previous speakers, if we do learn the lessons from this crisis, yes. But um, to learn the lessons, we need to review our action, to, to learn how to better prevent, prepare, or manage future crises, and then, once reviewed, to analyze them and put them into action, so to say. But we also need to exchange those lessons between countries because I think there's not one solution if it's all and exchanging those lessons, success and failure, could also help each country to uh, improve its preparations to future crises. Um, this is what have some people, and I think it's in the EGA that they call about the social vaccine, which I really like that expression. I think it's an expression used in the EGA opinion. This will help up upholding the value-based approach, which proved to be essential for decision at collective as well as individual level during the pandemic. Public dialogue is also extremely important, including on the result of the review of the actions taken, what it's done, with a view to identify priority values that would help rebuilding trust in government and scientific institutions. Transparency and accountability in decision-making will also be determining factor to rebuild that trust. And just to end on a sort of a proactive note, the Council of Europe will continue to provide support to this end and to offer a privileged platform for the cooperation, not only between member states, but as was highlighted uh, by Ross Upshur in particular, but also between stakeholders. And we've been trying to develop, for example, training courses with lawyers and health professionals and mixed uh, those different stakeholders in uh, the discussion and the different events we have organized to try to learn lessons and be better prepared for future crises. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I would also like to put a question to you. I mean, the Council of Europe is an important policy-making organization. You are a guard and even a lighthouse, if you like, for, for human rights. But um, what is your feeling? How was your many statements and recommendations received in member states? And how do you see the link between words and deeds? Um, that's, that's, I started with this on, on theory and practice. Yeah. Uh, and I think that what we need to do, at least for an organization like the Council of Europe, is not to remain at the level of the theory, but also to, have to practically help implement the member states in implementing what we had agreed in the text and in the paper. In addition, uh, as you know, the Court of Human Rights has already addressed some cases related to COVID-19, but only a few of them. Well, we might expect that there will be uh, some more cases coming. And there is a point that I've actually not mentioned in my presentation is that there, there is a possibility to derogate uh, from uh, the, the commitment under the Convention on Human Rights and 10 countries have actually done so during the pandemic. Um, and, and currently, I think there is a, a quite an extensive analysis on the uh, conditions of these derogations. And I think here again, we could learn lessons and, 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 and get some interesting elements for the future. But uh, again, I think our work should not stop at the time where you have a nice paper on the table. We need to move forward, and we try to do that also on bilateral basis. For example, we have a big cooperation project in Armenia, and uh, this actually was implemented during the pandemic, and Armenia is one of the countries where not only the pandemic uh, take place, but also the war. And that's the case in a few of a Council of Europe member states. So the impact on the healthcare system were very important. And we see the willingness of those countries to uh, benefit from the support of the Council of Europe to have very practical solutions to address those concerns. So 
I'm optimistic in the possibility to do so, but that's again a cooperation between the state and the organization. Of course. Thank you very much. You're welcome.